Hello and welcome back to the third round. This is the second video in a two-part Little Helpers series dedicated to reversing units. The remote control technology Merklin fitted to all its analog locomotives in double O then H O scale between 1938 and the early 2000s. In part 1, we covered the origins of the technology, some working principles, and looked at the different types of reversing units released over the years. Today, we will cover common issues and fixes, and we might also debunk one or two myths in the process. This video assumes familiarity with locomotive maintenance, as well as the basic concepts covered in part 1. So if you haven't already, I'd strongly recommend you watched it first, I have put a link in the info box at the top and in the video description. As with other little helpers, this video was made to be used as a reference, so I have organized it in chapters for ease of navigation. Final thing before we set off, if you end up liking this video, and you want to support the channel, please be sure to hit the like, subscribe and alert button before leaving today. Super thanks are also available if you feel the content deserves it. Whatever the option you choose will be much appreciated. Many, many thanks. Now, on to our topic. Merklin reversing units in all flavors are simply rock solid. The reversing unit is usually the first item I try out whenever I receive a new locomotive, and in over 99% of cases it just works, whatever the age. It is pretty much a if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of thing, and something I very rarely have to touch. Having had the opportunity to work on hundreds of locomotives over the years, I can confidently state that issues are usually linked to some form of human intervention. Among other things, accidental damage done while servicing other parts of a locomotive, or adjustments performed by a previous owner. I am sure that most of you are expecting me to mention something about springs, so this is a good place to start. As covered in part 1, the lever spring is a critical component of all electromechanical units. Its purpose is twofold. It resets the lever at the end of the switching process, and it also counteracts the effect of the driving current whilst allowing the lever to move as far as the switching position when switching current is applied. A locomotive will not run if it is missing. Spare springs were often included with new Merklin models, either taped to a surface somewhere in the box or in a little compartment in the styrofoam inlays. Changing the spring is also a step that features frequently in videos about basic locomotive maintenance. This might convey the impression that they regularly need attention. This is not the case. Springs take many decades, if not centuries, to lose their elasticity, so they are unlikely to need replacing because of age alone. I own 70-year-old models that are still running fine on their original spring. The only reason for the spare lies elsewhere, in my opinion. During servicing, springs can easily get caught on something and sometimes fly off, never to be seen again and this indeed happens to be the most frequent reason for which I would have to replace them. As a consequence, it is an item I always have in my spares box. Merklin still sells them in a bag of five under reference number 7194. The presence of a spring is not enough to ensure a good operation. Its tension also needs to be right. There are hundreds of videos about this, but I think most focus on the symptom rather than the cause. This is a little helpers video, so I will show the procedure here too, but I will try and put a bit more meat on the bone, because a symptom doesn't always mean an adjustment is required. Let's start by looking at how things should behave. For any electromechanical unit produced from 1957 onwards, 
the correct spring tension should allow a locomotive to run at full throttle and the locomotive should be able to reverse without jumping more than a centimeter or so. Out of the factory, all locomotives were adjusted to do just that. Despite this, Merklin gave instructions on how to adjust the tension in its manuals. Why did they do that? At the factory, the ladies testing and adjusting the reversing units during quality assurance were doing this under ideal conditions, with a brand new locomotive, good track and a normalised electricity supply. The same conditions were not a given on the customer's side, especially as far as main supply was concerned. Until the mid to late 1960s, differences in voltages and quality of the electrical grid were relatively commonplace and could impact the output of a transformer as it is proportional to its input. Mains too low, less voltage and current to the track. Mains too high, more voltage and current to the track. Over time, these differences evened out, but the voltage increased, going up from 220 volt to 230 volt plus or minus a few percents in Europe. The UK ran and still runs at 240 volt. Merklin transformers designed for 220 volt, those with a metal casing or a blue plastic casing, will have a higher output today as a result. This and other aspects, such as maintenance, can impact the operation of the reversing unit, hence the occasional need for an adjustment. The adjustment procedure is simple. These diagrams will most certainly look familiar to most of you. Using a flathead screwdriver, the spring arm on the lever needs to be bent sideways, closer to the switch if the tension needs increasing, or away from the switch if the tension needs reducing. When to do what depends on the symptom, but appearances can be deceiving, and this is what my gripe with most how-to videos on the topic is about. The typical video usually involves a hastily assembled straight section of track, a 60-year-old suicide transformer, and a locomotive. The track often looks like it hasn't seen any use for a few decades, it is dirty or oxidized, the locomotive hasn't been serviced, and the transformer is spitting out wrong voltages. The effect is guaranteed, and the procedure shown, whilst usually correct, is likely to have been completely unnecessary given the setup. Remember the factory conditions I mentioned earlier? It is important to try and get as close as possible to those before attempting any adjustment. It would be difficult to do anything about any quality issues on the main supply side, although a recent white transformer would help a lot in this respect, but everything else is well within our control. This means the track needs to offer good conductivity and be located within 2 meters of a power feed. It doesn't need to be spotless, but it shouldn't be covered in dried oil, oxidized or rusty either. The locomotive should ideally be freshly serviced, with clean wheels and good ground contact. A good way to test this is to observe the driving behavior of the locomotive. If it randomly cuts off or seems to hesitate in places, then this aspect might need more attention. As with everything maintenance related, a visual inspection is usually a good place to start. So here's how a reversing unit should look if left stock. The spring should be intact, the arm should be at a 90 degree angle to the rest of the lever, and it should be on an even level, not bent up or bent down. If anything looks different, then someone has been tinkering. It is also important to check the unit can change over easily, especially if the plastic around the solder pads for the motor windings look melted in places. You can check that by pushing the lever manually. With the locomotive upright, 
the rocker switch should move to the opposite side every time the lever is pushed. If it doesn't, this needs fixing first. My preference is to immediately revert to a factory setup and proceed from there. Most of the time, this will already be enough. Now, let's look at common symptoms. I'll be using a freshly serviced logo, of course, to demonstrate the various modes. First, we have the situation where a locomotive might suddenly stop with lights on as the throttle is being turned up, or remains at a standstill with lights on after a signal has been set to green. After turning the throttle down and back up, the locomotive departs in the opposite direction. Looking at the behaviour of the reversing unit, we can see that despite receiving only driving current, the lever has moved to the switching position, something the spring is supposed to counteract up to full throttle. Its tension is therefore too weak, so we need to gently bend the spring arm towards the switch to increase the tension. There we go! Easy! Then we have a situation when a locomotive might set off very fast instead of reversing. The typical how-to video would tell you that the spring is at fault here, and that its tension is too high. In such cases, the lever will not travel far enough to be able to push the rocker switch, and the switching current will start powering the motor. Given the higher voltage, the locomotive will set off at a higher speed than full throttle. In my experience, the spring tension would have to be extremely high for this to happen. For example, if someone has shortened the spring for some reason. I usually find this type of things in very light models that are prone to stopping suddenly when accelerating. The Merklin 3095 we have here, or one of its derivatives, is a very good example. The spring arm would therefore have to be pushed away from the switch to reduce the tension, or the spring would have to be lengthened a bit, as you can see here. OK, let's try it now. Perfect! But this was a very extreme scenario, and I had to stage it for you. This almost never happens, and when the symptom occurs, it is more likely that something else is at play here. Let me demonstrate. We have another locomotive that switches properly, as we can see. Now let's move it back a bit. Now let's try and reverse. See, it's shooting off again. What is happening here is that I have an active braking section. It works by dropping the voltage by a few volts, I think it's about 3 volts here. When I send 24 volts to the track, only 21 will reach the locomotive in that area. This is enough to allow current to move the lever past the driving current limit, but not enough for the lever and pin to reach their destination. The rocker switch will remain connected, and the current delivered at 20 volt will start powering the motor. Now let me deactivate the braking section. Let's give it another go. That's it, we're back in business. Now, this type of behaviour could also occur if the switching pulse is too short, the track is dirty, or the locomotive is too far from a power feed. An example that immediately comes to mind would be a typical 240 by 120 cm double oval with a single power feed. The double oval might be perfectly fine, but as soon as you try reversing where you need it the most, the shunting area in the centre, the locomotive will start misbehaving. If we look at the shortest current path, it is well over 2 meter between the transformer and the uh, centre of the layout, following the track, uh, 
So you might be able to measure the full 24 volt, but the resistance of the track would limit the amount of current reaching the loco, with the same result. What is needed here is not an adjustment, but an additional power feed in the area. So, it is always advisable to check the behavior of the locomotive in different areas of the layout before reaching for the screwdriver. So far, I have shown how to adjust the spring on the most common type of unit. How about the earlier units with rotating wheels? Here the principles are the same. But we have no adjustment method. The only way to reduce the tension of the spring is to extend it by pulling it gently from both ends to try and reduce its elasticity. To increase the tension, the spring can be shortened by attaching it a couple of loops earlier. Should the spring need to be shortened, one has to be mindful that the excess spring doesn't touch the inside of the locomotive body. Uh, it could cause a short or prevent a smooth motion of the lever. Whatever the type of mechanical unit, it is advisable to test both reverse and full throttle behavior after every adjustment as a change of tension in one direction can impact the other. The length of the jump can be adjusted a bit more at that stage by moving the spring arm in small increments towards the switch until a good balance is achieved. I might be stating the obvious here, but the field windings have a capacitance. As a result, a few switching pulses issued in very short succession will cause larger jumps. So it is best to First set the throttle to stop, wait a few seconds to allow the charge to drain, then reverse when testing or fine-tuning the adjustment. A lot of mechanists have spent many hours over the years trying to eliminate the jump by adjusting the reversing unit. Some even swear they are routinely doing it. But uh, I might put this down to a mild case of exaggeration or maybe cognitive bias. Simply put, this cannot be achieved on a properly serviced locomotive. At best, it can be reduced and often at the detriment of other operational aspects such as max speed. The reason is simple. Electricity travels at the speed of light, the lever doesn't, neither does the human hand actioning the throttle. I have taken a couple of high-speed shots of the switching. Watch when the chassis starts to move in relation to the position of the lever. Whatever the spring adjustment, the time it takes for the lever to cut the circuit will be enough for the motor windings to draw a non-negligible amount of 24 volt current and the motor will rotate. The amplitude of this rotation will vary depending on the weight and gearing of the locomotive. This state of affair was the very reason why electronic pre-reversing units were developed. Once an adjustment has been made, it is very unlikely the reversing unit will have to be touched again. The only reason I could think of doing this would be an upgrade of transformer from an older metal transformer or blue transformer to a more recent white one, or maybe even a house move. Now let's have a look at issues. I will focus on stuff I frequently come across, which should give us a representative enough sample of what to expect, hopefully. In general, if locomotives are used, they will need a service at some point, and this is when little accidents can happen. I found that field winding wires are frequently involved. The usual symptom would be that the reversing unit makes the usual switching noise, but the locomotive either doesn't change over, or it runs only in one direction. There are multiple causes for this. The first one is cable management, especially in locomotives with little internal space. A wire can easily get trapped between the body and the reversing unit and get in the way of the lever. On wheeled units, a wire might even shift or crush one of the contacts, so it helps memorizing the location of the wires after removing the body, 
Maybe by taking a few pictures from various angles in order to ensure the wires are put back in the right place once the service has been done. Another cause could be broken field winding wires. The usual place where this happens are the solder pads on the reversing units. It should be very obvious if this happens, as usually one of the wires will be dangling loose. During servicing, the motor often needs to be taken apart, which involves moving the windings. Very often, the windings are terminated on the reversing unit. Winding wire has a solid core. Over time, metal fatigue can develop and the wires can break just short of the solder joints. Wire breaks can also occur on the winding side of the motor plate. There we should have two wires soldered to the pad and a break can also be hiding inside the little protective sleeve that's usually covering the wire between the cover plate and the windings. If there was one reason to invest in a multimeter, that would be it, as a quick conductivity check will quickly reveal any issue on that front. A wire break is not a major thing, but a time where nothing can be done without a soldering iron. And this is where things can go wrong, sometimes horribly. The contact pads on the reversing unit are held in place by little plastic supports that can melt very easily. When that happens, the pads might shift a bit and render the unit sticky at best or unusable at worst. So proceed with extreme caution here. On wheeled units, things are a bit easier in this respect as the materials used are more resilient. Merklin usually uses protective sleeves on exposed winding wire, so it might not be immediately obvious to anyone who doesn't know about coils or windings that it is enameled copper wire, which is actually already isolated by its enamel layer. It certainly took me a while to realize this. Certain things are only obvious or easy if you know about them in first place. Now, this has implications when soldering. In theory, the enamel should burn off when exposed to the heat of the soldering iron. But if the temperature is not hot enough, this will not happen, resulting in a wire soldered in place but not conducting. Very annoying if the surface supporting the pad is not heat resistant and you have to go back. So I have grown to make sure to apply heat to the wire for a few more seconds than I usually would before tinning it, followed by a quick check with the multimeter. There always needs to be a bit of slack to be able to move these wires so they are not in the way of moving parts. So it is a good idea to have a sacrificial winding to hand to be able to extend wires if need be. I hate soldering, so I try not to put this type of wire under stress as much as possible. Basically, it is all about being gentle when dismantling the motor to avoid pulling or bending anything as much as possible. Now, let's have a look at wheeled units as they can also exhibit similar symptoms. Here we have to make sure the ratchet is working as it should. The lever should always engage with the tooth gear. It could happen that the lever shifts to the side and the hook misses the gear as a result. This would occur if the plastic guides near the ratchet wheel at the top of the switch are damaged. If this was the case, not much could be done and the reversing unit would have to be replaced. If the locomotive doesn't move at all but the reversing unit is operational, uh, you should hear it when switching, it could be that the switch at the top of the unit doesn't close properly. This can be adjusted with gentle bending. It could also be that the connection from the switch to the motor is interrupted. 
A quick conductivity check with the multimeter should reveal any issue. Usually, the wire simply needs resoldering somewhere. If the electromagnet side is OK, then the winding wires need to be checked. It would be using the same procedure as the one we covered earlier. And finally, we have the contact springs for the wheels on the side of the unit. On units with loop springs, the springs might have been crushed or simply lost contact with their wheel. Here, it is usually just a matter of gently widening the loop from the inside of the loop with a small flathead screwdriver to re-establish the contact. It could also be an alignment issue, especially on units with straight springs. The reversing unit is made of two assemblies, the electromagnet, lever and contact springs on one side and the switch on the other. The two are stacked and attached to the chassis with a single screw. It is possible that the assemblies become misaligned over time, causing a loss of contact. To fix this, the screw needs to be loosened and the switching assembly repositioned so the springs are aligned with the wheels again. When loosening or tightening the screw, be mindful not to break the wire soldered to the tag in the proximity of the screw. This is the ground wire for the electromagnet. Repairing any damage caused here will be tricky, if not impossible. A loose screw or broken ground wire would cause the reversing unit not to switch at all. The electromagnet wouldn't respond and the reversing lever wouldn't move. But the locomotive would run and change direction when moving the lever manually. Now, what about the electronic units? I haven't mentioned them so far. It is because, in my experience, these are extremely reliable and cannot be adjusted anyway, as they have no moving parts. The components used on these units are usually rated for higher voltages than required, so unlike early digital decoders, they are usually fine to use with all types of transformers, including the electronic controllers 6699 and 6600. There is one exception to this though, the circuit boards used in the SBB arrows, the red or blue varieties, for example the 3125 or 3126. I made a video about these a long time ago, I've put a little link at the top now. With all this said, electronic components don't always age well, so as a precaution I try to keep them away from higher voltages. I use recent transformers and I avoid using them in shuttle mode with the electronic controller 6600. OK, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground now. As mentioned earlier in the video, I have picked issues based on the frequency I come across them. This approach is obviously heavily dependent on my circumstances, so my frequent might be somewhat different from someone else's. One thing is sure, the list of issues covered in this video is not exhaustive. Fortunately, there are a few tools at our disposal that could help fill a few gaps. Service sheets are usually available on the Merklin website. From the 1980s onwards, they include wiring diagrams that can help in troubleshooting. Merklin also published a service manual in several languages. The references are listed on screen now. You can find used hard copies for sale in all the usual places, and there are a few PDFs also floating around on the internet. Google should return a few options there. The book is very well written, easy to understand, and contains an excellent troubleshooting section, which will help solve many issues very quickly. I'd actually recommend reading the entire book as it probably contains everything you'd ever want to know about maintenance of Merklin HO products.
No model comes with a full service history and the internals are rarely shown on online listings, so it is always good to keep a few spares. Aside from the 7194 springs I mentioned earlier in the video, I also try to keep a choice of reversing units. Due to the popularity of digital conversions, they are quite easy to come by. They can be found on auction sites or by posting something on a forum. There is a good chance someone has a drawer full of them somewhere. If you are so inclined, there is also the option of replacing the reversing unit with a digital decoder, as most can operate in analog mode. Here you'd have to make sure to buy a current Merklin product if you intend to use the old types of transformers. Anything Merklin produced before 2012 will only operate safely with a recent white transformer. Finally, there is one analog upgrade option available from Uhlenbrock. I have no experience with this product so cannot advise on its reliability. I simply know it exists. It looks like a simple swap-in-place operation that does not require any modification to the motor or lighting and adds motor regulation, which is quite nice. Or it sounds quite nice, at least. I might try one of these at some point. OK, I think we are way past the information overload stage now. In part 1 I had promised to cover the configuration used in multiple units such as the 3071 TE RAM or the uh, battery rail bus, the 3028 with the um, trailer 4028. Uh, I will do this now in a dedicated video. I don't know when yet, uh, hopefully within the next few months. This future video could potentially be an opportunity for me to cover additional uh, aspects I haven't covered today. So uh, if anything particular comes to mind, please drop me a comment down below. Uh, I'll keep an eye on them and I'll try and include them if uh, I can. I'd like to thank you very much for spending so much of your time with me today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully enough for you to give it a like and maybe subscribe if you haven't already done so or even send a super thanks my way if you feel the video was worth it. Thanks as ever for your support and bye for now.